Uh, everyone, welcome to the Escapist Expo. Uh, we are your side room entertainment. <laughs> so the name of this panel is Retro Gaming, which is in itself a pretty nebulous term, uh, but we're planning on basically talking about retro gaming, why, why it's interesting, why people still do things with it, uh, try to promote it, and keep it uh, you know, basically relevant to today's world. So uh, I am uh, Joey DeSena. I uh, work for uh, RetroWare TV. I do uh, some web videos, 16-bit um, uh, games, the uh, way that video game tech works, and such. Uh, I'll be your moderator for today. They're good videos. You should check them out. <laughs> I swear, 16-bit gems. Thank you. The lovely person, the lovely person to my right here is Chris Pranger. He uh, does videos for The Escapist, No Right Answer, and Media Sandwich. But uh, he also, uh, more importantly for this panel, is a localizer for Nintendo of America. Uh, for, uh, I have to make it very clear, however, he's not a spokesman for Nintendo of America, uh, especially for people watching this on the camera. Yeah, to make uh, it very clear, I don't speak for Nintendo. I'm completely my own entity right now. So if I say anything that you construe <laughs> as bad or wrong, uh, it wasn't Nintendo saying it, it was me. <laughs> And then to his right, we have uh, a true luminary of the industry, Warren Robinette, who uh, worked for Atari back in the day, in the glory days of the 2600, and actually developed Adventure uh, for the Atari 2600. Who I think is the, the first action adventure game uh, credited with the first Easter egg, which was yeah. hit the credits, basically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, later went on to uh, co found the Larian Company. Uh, then, to his right, uh, we have Gary Vincent and Mike Stuhler, uh, both from the American Classic Arcade Museum, uh, which is housed in Fun Spot, the largest arcade in the world, up in Weirs Beach, New Hampshire. Uh, and basically, what they do there is preserve classic arcade games. Uh, it's, it's magnificent. If you ever happen to be up wandering in New Hampshire, you have to go and check it out. So, let me start out with, why do we care about retro video games? Uh, I think the ACAM guys would be good to start off this. Why do you spend so much time and effort and money uh, setting up this, this charity organization and preserving these old games? Well, what it, what it started out with was an observation that there were fewer and fewer places where people could go and still play the, the coin-off games that, I guess we could say, kick-started you know, video games as, as popular. People were playing Space Invaders and Asteroids and Pac-Man and Frogger and all the, the classic titles that people remember. But unfortunately, being big and bulky in having them out in an arcade, if they don't make money, they were gone. And usually what that meant is they got put somewhere in storage until the roof leaked and everything got wet and then it was destroyed. And then it became, how flat can I smash this thing down to get more of them in the dumpster? And it was in uh, September of 98 that, uh, just a little quick background, I've, I've been in coin-op and the business for be 31 years now, and worked at Fun Spot all that time. And so September of 98, I just presented it at a, one of the meetings. I said, look, I want to try to do this side project, if it's all right with everyone, because no one seems to be saving the coin-op arcade history for people to still play. Sure, people were buying games, putting them in their basements, and amassing, you know, beautiful home collections and stuff. But if you didn't know that person, you, you were not going to be able to play that game. So what the, my goal was, was to have a place where people could come anytime, play the, the classics that they wanted, and for a few minutes or a few hours or a few days, you know, turn the, the, the clock back and they were a, a teenager again in the arcade. Or in nowadays what we're seeing is people who are too young to remember the heyday of the coin op video arcade can now come in and kind of relive that experience with what we've created uh, up on the third floor of Fun Spot. And so we, we came at it from a preservation standpoint first so that people you know could come and Experience, but you know, made the game so popular. I'm sure you could 
elaborate on any other things? Yeah, there, there are some other things that uh, that we've been able to do with ACAM uh, as a result of, of, uh, of the preservation work that was started in 1998. We were actually just talking about one of those things before we started, and that has to do with uh, with being able to get some of these old games out in front of the people that are studying computer graphics and computer de uh, gaming development right now. Uh, and we frequently have groups of high school age and college age people that come through uh, our facility in order to get a look at that. You know, our thought is it's very difficult to appreciate where we're at now until you've had a lack of look back at where things used to be. And having a facility like ours and getting this stuff out in front of people, I think, is a really good opportunity for people to see how things have evolved over the years. Uh, and that's that's been a very active uh, part of what we do as well. I think just one thing to point out is a lot of times when people hear the word museum, they picture miles and miles of red velvet ropes and you can just stand there and look at things. But ours is 100% interactive. If you want to play Computer Space, the first commercially available coin-operated game, it's right out there on the floor. Go up, touch it, throw a coin in it, play it. And you have you have an exhibit, well, exhibit. You have a bunch of arcade games here that people can. It's all in free plays, and they can try it out. So sure. Yeah, I, I highly. Yeah, yeah we, we were very fortunate this weekend. We were approached by uh, by the escapists to provide uh, an exhibit here this weekend. We looked into what it would cost to bring games down here, and it was going to be close to ten thousand dollars. So we were very fortunate we were able to work with a local collector, Michael Currents, and he was very kind enough to bring his personal collection here this weekend to work with us so people have uh, classic games to play. It's a good so I want to give a little shout out to, uh, to Michael for all of his hard help, uh, hard work, and uh, all of his contributions to everything here this weekend. So Gary, you mentioned um, a bit of a nostalgia factor as well for people who um, grew up with these games back in the day. They were teenagers, maybe in the late 70s, early 80s, and so forth. There's a bit of a, there's a wide range of age, ages on this panel, uh, you know, uh, but we're all interested in these same retro video games. Uh, Chris, I believe, as the youngest uh, member. Yes. <laughs> in, in, in uh, what, 25, correct? 25, maybe 26 and 25. So, so when nostalgia's not a factor for you, why, why, why do you like to go and play Pong? What's your, or adventure, or? Or anything like that. What's what's the draw to you? You have well, oh, wow, you can play. Of course, I could play wow, but it's just I want to make progress bar go up, and that's not fun to me. <laughs> and so, because I do that enough in any other day life, and that's practice my job is just make all make the progress bar go up to the next. But with retro games, especially, there's a it's all about the core gameplay. It, it everything is boiled down. A lot of the games nowadays, they're all retro games. Like Call of Duty is such a retro game. Like it's got actually gone back to the arcade style of. Quick matches, quick spawn, let's just play. Oh, you died, next in line, next quarter, next quarter, except we just removed the quarter and we made it a month-long subscription fee you have to pay instead. But essentially, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, like online, it's an arcade game. It's the, it's the classic experience. So much of it, of what we have now, is still classic and people recognize that. And that's why there's been a huge resurgence, I think, of indie games and they're indie in that they have reskinned a bunch of classic concepts. They just do. We have the technology and the capabilities to make hand-drawn art, you know, a legit thing they can do, try new ideas, and just generally rework some of the, the tried and true methods. This is, should I bring up Gunpei Yukoi's quote now? Perfect timing. Perfect timing, <laughs> yeah. Gunpei Yukoi, the man who invented the Game Boy, genius, revolutionary. Um, he had a philosophy, and I'm probably remembering it wrong, but it's lateral thinking through, I think, withered technology. Essentially meaning taking what works and make it work until it doesn't, essentially. Don't keep it, you don't, there's no reason to make something new if something old still functions. So take what still functions and improve upon that and keep doing that. So instead of this, everything's done, scrap it, new item, scrap it, new item. It's what worked, let's add this, let's add this. And so that's kind of where retro gaming comes into play is there's still so much that works, that functions perfectly. We know this because we play it. We still can go back to the old games and say, this holds up because it plays well. It plays great. And nowadays, you know, we're if a lot of times we are scrapping everything. And that's why this new console generation has kind of been, you know, we have scrapped so much and oh, we're all focusing on motion controls and stuff. And I feel like, well, we need to go back to what worked. And a lot of people have been doing that these days. And so that's why with the download services, you've got a lot of Retro games and kind of retro throwbacks as well that you can do as well. 
It's kind of people want to go back to what works. Uh, Gary and Mike were talking about the kind of uh, private preservation, uh, you know, the museum outside that takes these games kind of out of effect and keeps them up going and so forth. I'm kind of curious, I want to ask about uh, these companies themselves. How do they see their own, how do they preserve their own games? Warren, back when you worked for Atari, was preserving uh, code or preserving the games, were they, was there any sort of forward thinking that, wow, this is going to be a big deal even three decades later? Uh, I'm thinking not, not, not that First of all, I think you guys should get some red velvet rope. <laughs> Put it on computer space. That's how people know what's important. The red velvet rope is symbolic. Sure. It's true. Yeah. Now back to your question. <laughs> so now, uh, um, it's kind of hard to now, to, I, I, I'm going to try and sketch what it was like back then, but it's going to maybe hard for y'all to come with me because Video games were new. They weren't a part. They weren't on anybody's map because they hadn't existed before the early 1970s, which is when the first consoles came out. Atari made a couple of early games. One was called Computer Space, which they have at the museum, and another was called Pong, which was the first. I've heard of it. First, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. and that's the first time that a lot of people ever saw a video game. I remember playing one with my father in the airport in my hometown, Springfield, Missouri. It was a maze game. And I was uh, 18, I think, and uh, we had two joysticks, and we played it, and I thought it was interesting. But, but people, not only were people not thinking about preservation at Atari, it was competitive. There were other game companies. They were trying to survive. They were trying to win. They were trying to do whatever it took to sell games, make money, beat the competition. And they succeeded at it. Um, So, no preservation. You want, me to try, you want a little more of a sketch of what it was like in the old days? Sure, sure. So my first day, so I was 26 years old in, in um, 1977. My first day of work at Atari uh, in Cal Sunnyvale, California. Um, came to work and my boss, Larry Kaplan, said, your job is to design games. Now go design one. It wasn't any direction. It was uh, they gave me an example of a, of a program for an Atari video game. It was Combat, so you could go through it, you could run it, you could modify it. There were other programmers to talk to. There were a total of eight at that time, 2,600 programmers. And uh, he, Larry also told me that everybody in marketing was an idiot. <laughs> 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 Well, it's the classic viewpoint of program. It's like cats and dogs, programmers and marketing people. The marketing people think that the programmers are socially incompetent idiots who uh, don't know how to dress properly and don't know how to talk to people. And uh, they're sort of right. And uh, <laughs> the programmers think that the marketing chicks are airheads that couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag, technically, which oftentimes. I mean, and they weren't trying to be programmers, so they just talk past each other. Still like that uh, today at Nintendo first? No comment? <laughs> <laughs> no, everyone's nice. Okay. <laughs> I, like, I like everyone in my company. They're very nice. Yeah, so <laughs> hi to your boss. <laughs> so, actually, you discussing what it was like to work back in the day uh, at Atari and so forth, this is kind of that sort of preservation we were talking about. It's interviewing and talking to people about what it was like. So, Well, another thing that's different is back then it was one person made one game. It didn't take very long either. It took four, three to six months because there was, um, nowadays we have megabytes and gigabytes of memory in computers and in electronics, but back then the amount of memory available to you as an Atari 2600 programmer was 2K, later they raised it to 4K, okay? and that was for the program, the graphics, and the sound. It wasn't so, uh, it was hard to do anything at all, and to do something that actually interested game players in that tiny amount of memory was pretty challenging. But something that I realized later is that through experience, and then it sort of hit me in the face, I had been taught this thing when I was in school, probably in English class, proverb called 
form is liberating. Any of you ever heard this? No? Really? You, you were asleep in English. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, maybe I heard it in art class, because I didn't take some art classes when I was in college. Um, but the idea was that if you're in a form, like, uh, uh, for example, writing a poem where you only get 14 lines to write a sonnet and it has this rhyme scheme you have to fit it into, that was supposed to be liberating. And that did not make any sense to me. Okay? How is that liberating? It's just a hassle. It's something you have to fight through. It's a problem. It's a limitation. Okay? And then after I'd done a few Atari 2600 video games, what I realized was that even though it was hard to fit a game into 4K or 2K, it, it gave you some limitations. So you could start out sort of using the limitations, steering you into what was possible, because there were so many things that weren't possible. And it, and it was actually my friend, I realized later on. The limitations were my friend, because, because nowadays if you start out and you want to do I bet there's some people here who would like to become a billionaire by writing the next mega hit video game, right? But where do you even start? There, you could do almost anything. It's 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 a little bit paralyzing, I would think, to, to even know where to start. But of course, maybe not. Maybe you have a great <laughs> idea, and good luck. Yes. Uh, uh, so anyway. So uh, well, you had said also that uh, back back then the Atari. They weren't really looking forward toward preservation. That I mean, it was very beginning of the video game industry, so that wasn't part of their mind. But you were mentioning earlier a project. You were, you were mentioning earlier a project you were working on uh, to kind of do some of this preservation yourself uh, with your own code. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to talk about that, yeah, later. sure. So, um, so I handed off the code for my three video games that I did for the Atari Twenty Six Hundred back in. 1978 and 1979. So there's a lot of water under the bridge since then. Things have changed a lot in the game industry. But one thing that struck me a few years ago is that um, whereas the, 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 the memories are huge nowadays, the programs are huge, the graphics are enormous and complicated, back in the old days, it had to fit into the tiny little memory, so the games were not that complicated. And nowadays, one person could not comprehend the entirety of uh, Halo or something. It's the, the code would probably be this thick if you put it all together. Um, so it occurred to me that the programs back in the old days were so simple that you could actually understand the whole thing. The listing for adventure, for example, was about 1,500 machine language instructions. And if you printed out the listing, which is what we did back then, uh, it was about 25 pages long. And that included the data tables for the graphics and the data tables for the sound, okay? 25 pages it was not that long because it had to fit into 4K. That's that was the way it was. So anyway, the project that uh, I was telling the guys here about that I cooked up and I'm in the middle of it. I haven't finished it because I have a day job. My best <laughs> people on the panel. I work for Chris Packard, and uh, this is a side project. But the idea is to go back and what, well, I realized that the assembly language was kind of off-putting. Even to me, I wrote the code in the first place. But when I try, when I tried to disassemble it and then figure out what it did, it was rather painful. So I decided that the right thing to do is to translate the assembly language that I originally wrote into C, which most people nowadays know, most programmers know, and it's a lot easier to comprehend what in the hell it does and, and read it in C instead of in assembly language. So the project is just to go back and back translate it into C so that it's comprehensible and then break it up into little blocks of functionality, which I think of as paragraphs of code, and then put some paragraphs of English explanation between the paragraphs of code to try and take the original code and explain how and why it did what it did. And, and since I wrote it, I'm a good person to explain why. So someone could, I mean, you could find a C compiler, most Pretty easily nowadays. Some could take your original code, write it, write it themselves, see how it works. Maybe even modify it, make their own kind of hack version of the venture. And That's they, possible too. It would yeah. help them understand the process. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Chris, yes. Nintendo, Nintendo in general has a, a pretty long history. The video game history goes back to the seventies. Nintendo of America, um, founded in the early eighties. Nintendo of America would be. 
No, I'm sorry, it could be 81. No, you're, you're fired. It's, well, because Donkey Kong, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of NES, Donkey Kong came out in 81, so yeah. it had to be 80, 81 okay. was when US started, yeah. So, so it's, a, it's a company with a long history. Yes. How cognizant is it of its own history? How does it keep it? Well, the Kirby collection is coming out this weekend on the Wii, <laughs> so everyone make sure to get that because it comes with a collect book, uh, booklet and CD with awesome tracks uh, from the history. So yes, Nintendo knows their history very well, and they are aware because, I mean, it's Nintendo. They have a backlog that's longer than anyone else in the industry at this point of just, we, they have roots in new games that are from the retro era of, you know, the beginning. Don't you know, exactly. Um, but specifically at the company, like they make sure that you remember where they came from. So the first week uh, you start, they have a whole onboarding thing. They, they call it indoctrination as a joke. But it is kind of, because they start off in, I think, the first or second day, which is the highlight of it. This is the whole reason to go, other than Reggie's um, introduction speech to the 15 people, which he wasn't there for mine. I, he had jury duty that day. So <laughs> that was a bummer. But you go to the product showcase, is what they call it. And they, they say it's not a museum because they don't want this to be a tourist attraction because it's for employees only. Um, right in Nintendo America, as you come in, you can see the Bumblebee car from Mario Kart 7. Um, legit, you can ride it. Well, you can't ride it. <laughs> I think Reggie can ride it. Um, but you go, you turn around that, and then there's this encased structure that has four big panels that are always closed, always, because um, it's not for general public and not I can't even go in normally because it's not open. It's only pretty much open for employees when they have their onboarding. And they open this thing up, and this thing is incredible. It has all of the like the major milestones of Nintendo's history laid out, you know, displayed. Here's the NES, here's the Famicom, Super Famicom, Game Boy. It just goes through, including like it shows pictures of the old warehouse and things. And there's this whole computer display that just spreads out, and you can go chronologically any place you want. And then you know you click, whoop, and then a computer screen will show. It'll be like, ah, oh, you want to see the first NES commercials? Let's watch some. And it's just this crazy just display of, again, it's history, and they want. Remind you, yeah, this is where we came from. And on the outside, they have a bunch of old arcade cabinets. So we have uh, Radar Scope, and we have Donkey Kong, and a couple of the old uh, Play cho uh, Pro Choice? Play Choice. Play Choice. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we can't play those. And some, uh, someone informed me that some of them are actually just uh, cabinets with a TV screen and a constant loop in them. So I'm like, oh. Uh, hopefully someday they'll just unlock those. Is this where they keep the, the, was the Perfect Mario? The Perfect Mario is in the center of the of the display. So you can see from the stairs, there's this gold Mario statue. He's just in a jump pose. And someone explained, this is a perfect Mario. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Aren't they all perfect? And they're like, yes, but this one specifically, because no Mario is ever exactly the same game to game, and no one realizes. So it's kind of a faux pas to put two Marios from different games, like the, the models they're using right next to each other. So they have like universal models that's the perfect Mario. So this one's a perfect Mario jump pose. So if you ever, for some reason, lost all knowledge of Mario, if that were such a thing possible, um, you can go back to this perfect one and say, oh, this is exactly how he should look proportionally and how he should be posed and jumping. And so they have a couple of those in different places around, but they have the gold one that's like, obviously, the gold Mario shrine. You have to go by every time you go to lunch. You give, give a burn a little you, uh, you, you drop a few coins. Yeah. That, is, that is nice to hear that Nintendo has saved yeah. all of that history. Earlier this year, I sat on a panel for preservation, one that was moderated by John Anderson. Mm -hmm. And he's a writer, he had done a lot of research into video game companies, what did they do with all of their code when the company closed, or, and he found, uh, I think that we have tape of that somewhere, somebody yes, uh, we do. Uh, filmed the, the panel, and it was scary to listen to the number of companies that when they shut their doors, they just backed the dumpsters up and threw everything in and said, well, nobody's ever gonna want this. And he was he contacted, I think he said 80 different places, only got responses from 40, and of those 40, almost all of them had thrown away most or all of the uh, programming from the games they did. 
if I could expand upon that a little bit, um, I was fortunate enough a number of years ago to do a, a project for Atari called Flashback 2. Anybody here ever heard of that? A little uh, retro console, the uh, 402600 game stuff? Room yeah. Years, so yeah. Um, I was on the design team that put that together. The uh, the box was the brainchild of uh, Kerr Fendel, and then uh, myself and Marty Goldberg were the other two uh, technical engineers on that on that project. Um, many many years ago, um, Atari did a mass dump, and this was back in the day when they had their reverse merger with JTS. Back in the days of the Jaguar, they were just throwing stuff out left and right. And one of Atari's old programmers managed to get in contact with Kirk Vendell and said they're doing a dump. And Kirk got on a plane and took the red eye from New York to California and went dumpster diving. <laughs> and he grabbed everything. He grabbed old reel tapes off the mainframe. He, he, drew, he grabbed schematics. He, he grabbed uh, concept artwork and rented a storage unit out there and just kept everything in there. And periodically had to ship back to New York. So flash forward 10 years later, and there was an initial flashback that was done to commemorate an anniversary of the Atari 7800. And by the way, if you bought that, I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> not my proudest moment. But that showed us that there was a market to do flashback two properly, do the real machine with the real games and, and so on and so forth. And Atari had nothing. When we needed to go back and get the original design schematics so we could do our ASIC work and shrink everything down, Atari had nothing. And if Kurt had not done all of that work 10 years prior and put all his personal money and everything else into saving that stuff, Atari never would have gotten that product out the door. And in my experience, that's pretty symbolic of what's going on across the industry as, as we try to reach out to, to a lot of coin-op developers in, ter in terms of what they have from back in the day and what we can do to help them preserve that stuff. There seems to be a lot of that out there. And I know I personally, I find that very disturbing. Uh, and actually that leads me to the next thing I wanted to touch on was the amount of effort. You guys at AKM have hundreds of uh, classic arcade games, dozens of pinball games, or pinball tables. What, what does it take? Just give us a little taste of what it actually takes to preserve all of this stuff. I remember out of the, I was at that panel you were talking about earlier this year. The uh, lack of CRT monitors that is now proliferating throughout the, the world because no one buys them anymore. That's a real problem. Yeah. And, and anyone who has, you know, played a classic coin-op game, if if you put a flat screen LCD in there, it does not look the same. Yeah. Do do what you want, it does not look the same, and you can play it and you look immediately and you go, it's got a flat screen. And so what we've been trying to do is, you know resurrect as many CRT monitors that we can, and nobody's making CRTs anymore. So we, we have collectors who will go out and do raids or whatever on old warehouses or barns, and if they find extra, you know, picture tubes laying around or complete monitors, they'll give me a call and say, hey, we're gonna pick up a few extra, I'm gonna give them to you. And we take them and we're just storing them away because right now we have just about 300 pre-1988 games out on the floor, and 24 of which are pinballs. And to keep that size of a collection running, 12 to 15 hours a day, 364 days out of the year, wear and tear sets in. And, but we're, we try to keep it as true as possible to the original, and CRTs, like I had said in the other panel, it's, you're just gone, who wants them? And who is going to, you know, buy up the, uh, the closed down plant and say, hey, I'm gonna start manufacturing CRTs again. <laughs> There's just, you know, a lot of times like when vacuum tubes went by the wayside. Well, a vacuum tube's only that big, you know, and it weighs about two ounces, where you got a CRT, you know, this big, no and it weighs about 40 pounds. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, they're, they're hard to store, and, and of course the, uh, the vacuum tube came back because of a lot of the uh, musicians only want vacuum tube amps. Mm -hmm. So as a you know, I can't have solid state amps, it's gotta be vacuum tube. So with that, you know, there are still companies in, uh, you know, I think in China and, and uh, Russia and some of the other Eastern European countries that are still now pumping out vacuum tubes, but CRTs, 
it's um, you know video game collectors are going to want CRTs, but nobody else. Mm -hmm. And I think if, even if you did get it up and running again, the cost to buy them would be prohibitive. Not only just the the unit cost to make them, but then to ship them because they're they're so big and they weigh so much. Okay. And I'm sure it's uh, at least you have the uh, chair or I guess a charitable organization. It's well, a nonprofit. What it, yeah, what it is is we we set up the American Classic Arcade Museum as a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, and as I tell everybody, if you think there's a ton of money to be made in running old games, then everybody would be doing it. So uh, it's it truly is a labor of love. If we did not get free space to run our organization, we could never afford to put the number of games we have out. So it's, it's preservation first and foremost, and to allow people to actually to, to play it. You know, that was the whole point. The games were developed for people to play, to enjoy. Hey, I'm gonna compete against you. Let's play this game. And you can't do that, you can't touch it. So that, that was the whole thing, that it, it needed to be a hands-on museum. And a lot of times that word museum throws people because they just think that it's things to look at and not touch, but we definitely stress. I, get, I still get emails. If I come there, can I play the games? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> come on up. That's it. Yeah, um, yeah it, it, is, it is a little striking how there are so few organizations set up to, to do what what you do to preserve these old games. I know there's a pinball museum in Vegas, and uh, there's uh, the guys from Digital Press are getting the Video Game History Museum together. It's basically three guys <coughs> with giant private collections. Yes. And, uh, and Joe Stan Julie, the leader of that group, I mean, he is, his focus on the console world is, is equal to our focus on the coin op world. And there's a lot of synergy there between what he's doing and what we're doing, and that. You know, they, they picked an area that they have a really extreme amount of expertise on and they're focusing on it. And uh, we, you know, we know Joe and, and uh, um, you know, we certainly wish him the best with what he's doing there because we think he has a really good idea. And, uh, um, you know, he's hoping to take what he's doing with the consoles in the same direction that we've already done in the last 10 years with coin Yeah, it's very complimentary. Um, so, but that does bring up a point that the vast majority of you know, of these kind of historical artifacts, if you will, are in the hands of private collectors. Um, I don't know if uh, Chris or Warren, you guys are any sort of collectors at all, even uh, kind of a small hobby, don't keep any such uh, old uh, games sitting around? Or? Oh, any, if I put a lot of I keep it. I can't trade anything in. Like, that's a sin to me. I have some crappy, crappy games that cannot be traded because I own them. Like <laughs> Robin Hood on the PlayStation 2. <laughs> I, I was given that, and I'm like, I can get rid of this now. I own this. This is mine forever. So it's kind of a collector by default. It's collector by default, yeah. yeah. I There are some things I like to collect. Like, <laughs> some systems I prefer. Uh, oddly enough, I was really big into collecting stuff with the GameCube. Just because... That's pretty odd. Yeah, because it was my favorite system. Um, but, yeah, I just don't have the money. Like, I would love to collect a lot of stuff on the NES, especially. I'd love to be a big NES collector, but I just don't have the raw money for that. And... I can't find as much enjoyment if I get a game that I know is garbage, like Dr. Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde. Like if I bought that knowing, well, I know this is a bad game, I wouldn't want that. Like, I'm looking for Bucky O'Hare right now because I want that game, to play that game, because that's half the part of the game for me. So it's mostly the money is keeping me back from collecting. Otherwise, I would just die right now. And Warren, you were kind of not really well, I have copies of the game, working copies of the games that I've created. Mm -hmm. So I didn't throw away my Apple II or my Atari 2600, but I, I, I didn't throw away. Okay. I grew up before video games. So <laughs> I collected something that was atomic. My mother threw them all away. Uh, <laughs> you know, a, a lot of times people can look at the collector community as being a bad thing. Look at them as being hoarders and, and 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 keepers and stuff from other people, and I've never really thought of them that way because I know in our case with ACAM, the collector community has been huge for us. Um, you know, example like we mentioned earlier, the, the gentleman who brought all the games in here for us this weekend, a collector. Um, you know, collectors are huge sources of parts and other resources for us. Collectors are huge help for us when we go to other events like PAX East. Um, you know, people like Andy getting his monitors. Yeah. Um, you know, the collector community has been 
an incredible group of people to work with with what we do. And you know, a significant chunk of what we do we couldn't do without their help. It seems to me that if you're in the you know the habit of collecting this much, you're in it because you like the community, you like the culture, you like what is being collected. So the idea of hoarding it and then not letting anyone else touch it and play with it seems kind of counterproductive. Where you know that's so I I kind of got the sense that most collectors of you know retro games and stuff they want to keep it going. You know they are willing to help and they're willing to share you know where their stories and, and parts that they have. Sorry, you're, no, no, no. I was <laughs> when he said you know and have the collectors helped us and I got the call from from Andy that day and he says I got a bunch of monitors I want to give you <laughs> <laughs> and I said okay. Now are we talking like I bring a car over or I bring my pickup truck over? He goes, well, you got a trailer for that pickup truck? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I went over and I came back with 24 monitors. So it's just- I got a question for you. Yeah. What prompted you to dedicate a large fraction of your life to this? Insanity. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it was, that was where I started. When, when I walked in, I, I was a customer at Fun Spot in the summer of 81, and all of their college help left early. And I was still hanging around. They're like, hey, can you just help out for like the last three weeks of the summer here just so we can get beyond Labor Day and then things will slow down? I'm like, yeah, sure. And working there, I'm like, wow, this is kind of fun. And so at the end of that three week period, they went down to a very limited schedule that time, at, back in the day. And they said, you want to come back next summer? Sure, I'll come back next summer. How old were you? I was 19 when I started. Yeah, so yeah, I'm 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, it was fun. And to me, there was there was that time of the boom of the, the coin-op arcade, there was like a, a, like a feel to that that is very, very hard to replicate. It was... <coughs> You know, the games were all new, and people were running in, and they, they'd wait, you know, they, they knew you were getting a game delivery on such and such a date. We would put signs at the door, you know, coming next week, Galaga. And people would come, and they'd wait for the truck to arrive. The truck would come, and off would come this big cardboard box, and we'd open it up and bring it out, and people would just pile up and want to play that game. and. You know, I guess it's when anything is, is fresh or new and that it just, there was this feel to it. And then, of course, MTV started up and music videos and it just the whole, the whole era of that time was really a lot of fun. And that's what, you know, having lived through that from, you know, being in the arcade all the time, that's what I, I'm trying to do, you know, with the team we have with ACAM is replicate that experience as best we can. And I tell people, what, what I want you to be able to do is stand in the middle of the, the main room that we have, which is about 6,000 square feet, and just stand there and close your eyes and, it, and then open them, and it's just like somebody stuck you in a transporter and sent you back 30 years. That there's nothing in that room that's newer than 1988. There's nothing on the walls that's any newer than that, all the music that plays in there, is there's nothing newer than 1988 in that room. So that was a main focus, you know, beyond preservation, is to recreate that experience of being able to go into the arcade and you're, you know, you're playing a game of Defender and Duran Duran is playing music, <laughs> you know, throughout the room. And just to try to give people an idea and a feeling of what it was like. You know what, it was fun to be a programmer back in the old days too. Things have changed a lot in Silicon Valley over 35 years or whatever since the video game industry got started. Silicon Valley's dominated by money people nowadays, and buyers in a lot of ways. And make, they're probably necessary for a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar businesses. But back in the old days it was, um, nobody thought it was going to be a $10 million business, or I mean, that was more than Atari's revenues at first, and there weren't any other video game companies, really, in the, you know, back in the 70s, and uh, people got into it, it was a motley crew that we had at Atari, for example, 
uh, it wasn't ambitious young Stanford graduates who were, thought that it was their ticket to wealth and success. It was a random collection of hippies. <laughs> I've heard some stories, but I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's funny you should mention that because as we've done other panels at other and other events, and we've had exposure to other people, both on the console and, and the, the coin op side within Atari of that era, and, and you talk to the Howard Scott Warshaws, Rob Polaros, and, and other people, and you say to them, were you conscious of what it was that you were doing? You know, was it something that excited you, or was it just another job? And virtually all of them say it was just a job. You just had no concept Bob, of where this thing Bob was. Bob Polaros said it was just a job. He told me that in Philly Classic many, many years ago. Huh. Well, I thought it was a cool job. <laughs> <laughs> So what were the backgrounds of, of this Motley crew generally? Was it a lot of... Uh, well, there were a few, uh, about a quarter of the people, of uh, the programmers that are, So I, I was in the, the first group of programmers that was doing software for the Atari 2600. There was a bigger part of Atari that w were doing the arcade games. And, and so I, I didn't know them as well. We were kind of separate, so they may have had somewhat different backgrounds. But among the programmers, there were about a quarter of them who had some kind of technical degree from Berkeley. Like, I, I had a master's degree in computer science from Berkeley, and I was probably the most educated of all the programmers in terms of something specific for what I was doing. There's one guy who had a degree in zoology, and uh, there's one guy who's been a Mooney, and uh, I don't know how he got into it. Sorry. <laughs> From California. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure that I know the other degrees, but uh, when, when we got into a butting heads with this, so Atari was founded by Nolan Bushnell, who was kind of a hippie himself. Uh, and uh, he was kind of a hang loose guy. Pretty interesting. He had kind of what I now recognize as an entrepreneur's personality. Uh, crazy, but uh, not crazy enough that he it all blew up in his face before anything was produced. And uh, but then they sold the company to Warner Communications, a big back east media conglomerate. And so all of a sudden, we had some bosses, or at least the executives had some bosses on the East Coast. And they installed the Harvard MBA as president of Atari. His name was Ray Kassar, and he was uh, had a whole different mindset, kind of a controlling thing. That's, that's the famous story. Uh, was it you that talked to him and uh, basically saying, hey, why don't we have these programmers get some more credit or some such, and he basically compared you all to uh, uh, like a... High strung prima donnas? Yeah. <laughs> <was going. laughs> Well, so you're mixing up a couple of stories. But, well, so one story is that Ray Kassar, well, like in the early 80s, uh, apparently, I guess he really said this, that the, the 2600 programmers were a bunch of high-strung prima donnas. Okay, well, maybe that was true. It was anyway, it was the perception. <laughs> the other thing you're bringing up is, I, so I created this thing in my game, Adventure, that's now considered to be the first Easter egg, I guess. But to me, it was my signature, and the story, and the really short story is that uh, all the programmers at Atari were anonymous because we, we got we took a job there, we signed the uh, intellectual property agreement, and you'd work on this game. You created it yourself. It was one programmer, one game, and then when it came out in the stores, it was Adventure by Atari. And I already had one game, Slot Racers, was my first game. I saw how it worked, and my name wasn't there anywhere. And I guess I hadn't really thought too much about that, but. Um, so when I was working on Adventure, I thought it was pretty good and kind of pissed me off that uh, <laughs> I had to be anonymous. And I really didn't quite really comprehend what it meant to be published and have them put all over the world, but uh, I guess I comprehended it enough to be uh, irritated and a little bit mad. And so it didn't have much power. They, they weren't going to, if I went in and asked, they weren't going to say, oh, okay. <laughs> so what I did was I uh, I was working on this adventure game where it had different rooms and they had keys and other tools to get past obstacles. So it was a pretty natural type of game to create a room that was really hard to get into. And uh, so in that really hard to get into room, 
I did make it pretty hard to get into it. Yeah. They didn't have much of a testing process back then, but if they had tested it, they wouldn't have found this. And so anyway, what I put in there was my, what I thought of was my signature. It said, created by Warren Robinette. And uh, I handed out the code, and I, and, uh, I didn't tell anybody. And they made 300,000 cartridges and shipped them all over the world, and, and then it was too late to <laughs> get back in the box. Was there any retribution from that, or just anger, basically? Well, uh, the funny thing was, I, 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 working at Atari was really interesting, but it was, it was kind of like the Dickens line of, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, because it was a really interesting job. It would, turned out to be a really good stepping stone for me, but yet it was irritated to be, irritating to be disrespected by the CEO and be anonymous and have these power games pulled on you. So actually 11 out of the 12 Atari 2600 programmers quit within a period of about a year when things sort of went sour, and I was one of them. So by the time they discovered the secret room, uh, I was gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and they cut off my royalties. Oh no, they didn't give any royalties. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing they could do to me, really. But, <clears throat> and since this is a young audience, I'll tell you something from back then. But uh, maybe you shouldn't take this to heart. But <clears throat> I didn't have all that much money growing up in, in the Ozarks, and. Uh, and after I worked for a couple of years at Atari, I had more money in the bank than I'd ever had in my life, which is $10,000. I thought it was a lot back then. And I told my good friend Julius, I have enough money to get drunk 2,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> Not the yardstick I'd used. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we started a bit late, so I think we're going to be going a little bit past one. So I'm just going to keep talking until someone comes from that door and says uh, for us to stop. Um, and if anyone has a place they need to be, now is the free pass. We won't judge you. No, I won't judge you. I actually wanted to leave a little bit of room for questions, but uh, before that, was there um, anything you guys in general wanted to just kind of say about retro video gaming, how to promote it, how to... I, I'd actually like to ask Warren a question. Um, okay. All right. You know something that something that's been been thriving in the homebrew community right now is we're starting to see a lot of the people from back in the day have gone back and started doing coding again. Um, I think the most recent example that's gotten a lot of publicity is uh, is Ed Freaks, uh, who used to develop uh, for the Atari computer line back in the day, went on to Microsoft, made a huge name for himself with Xbox, went back and did uh, a 2600 game not that long ago. And I, I'm wondering whether or not there's there's ever been any uh, uh, desire on your part to maybe go back and and, uh, and maybe do another like a self-published game on, on one of the old consoles. Yeah, uh, I've, I've made actually made a try at it two or three times, but it's uh, I didn't realize how lucky I was when I was at Atari and they took. They just took whatever I handed to them and replicated it and marketed it. And mm -hmm. it. I mean, that's even though I didn't make any money from it, mm -hmm. I got paid twenty-two thousand a year, by the way. So that was that was an average engineer salary back then. But uh, but I was lucky in the publication sense that it, it just happened automatically. Uh, there are a lot of complications to actually getting making something that's any good yeah. and then finding somebody who wants to market it and. The, uh, the uh, cell phone games look like a really great place to self-publish mm -hmm. to me. Well, there's also uh, websites like Kickstarter, if you're familiar with that, where it's basically crowdfunding. It, it's, it's all the rage yeah. with yeah. video games, especially. This so th that's a yes. I, yeah. I, have, I have some several partially developed things, yeah. but nothing ever got to market. With, uh, with, with you know, sticking strictly with the 2600, you know, there are a number of different places where that type of thing could be published. Atari Age would probably be the most foremost example, where, you know, you just get the code to Albert, and he takes it from there. He's got cartridge shells, he's got boards, he's got everything, and he takes care of publishing all that stuff through for his Let, Let's say it's some unfinished business. <laughs> I, I, it's been uh, 33 years, and I've never done a sequel for adventure. Seeing that. <laughs> this fall, Adventure 2 for the 2600. Well, well, I'll tell you how to <laughs> Getting married and having three children did uh, 
get in the way of mm -hmm. uh, pursuing my personal hobby interests. Let's see. And are you still teaching? No, I'm not teaching. I'm, I'm working for uh, Hewlett Packard now, uh -huh. HP. I work for the corporate research lab of Hewlett Packard, which is called HP Labs. And I've actually been working on hardware for the last nine years. I'm in a, in a group there that discovered a new electronic component. Y'all have probably never heard of this. It's called a memorister. And uh, uh, if, you, if anybody's interested, I'll tell you a little bit more. But anyway, I've been working on hardware. <laughs> Right. Well, uh, are there any questions from the audience? We've been kind of jabbering for about a, a, an hour, but uh, is there anything about retro gaming or asking uh, Mr. Rob Pett? Well, we have 10 minutes, so any sort of uh, questions that you have, just raise your hand. Yes, sir. You mentioned you worked on three games, sir. Which which was the third game? You mentioned Slot Race oh. versus Adventure. What was the third? Basic program. Oh, which wasn't really a game. <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge. What was it? It was a cartridge. It was a 2600 cartridge. Yeah. And then you basically had to use the. Uh, how did you control the to create a basic program? What was the method? Well, so um, one thing that was going on back then was Atari. Everybody remembers the joystick controllers, but they had this paddle thing called a paddle controller that could be used for pong-like games. But and uh, those both of those plugged into these ports in the back. Uh, but they wanted to develop more controllers, so they created this keyboard controller, and there were two 12-button controllers, but you could slide them together and have a 24-button keyboard. And um, I volunteered to do a, a programming language interpreter on the 2600, because I had studied this sort of thing in graduate school. I was interested in it. But I, I was given this keyboard controller and told, you will use this keyboard. And so it was kind of hard to do because it only had 24 buttons. Uh, and so it was a bit, the interface was really clunky. It's not one of my shiny moments. <laughs> but I did get an interpreter to work in 4K and 128 bytes of RAM. So that is very fast. Any other questions? I got a question about the keyboard. Wait. Wait. <laughs> I have actually seen a panel at ECTC interview over a year ago with the creator of Marvel Madness. He talked about the, the, the how the Atari was, of course, anonymous and everything. And they had the arcade mentality of the, the key time you kill a player is in third seconds. Was there anything in the, the console side of that mentality, like trying to kill a player as quickly and make it as hard as the arcade? The key time to kill a player was a minute and 30 seconds. I, I think so. That was one of their sign rooms? Yeah, that was a design room because it, it was enough to keep the player interested and put another coin. Is that for an arcade game? Yeah, it's for an arcade Okay. Game. Well, yeah, that's a very good question. And, and uh, it brings up a point that's pretty interesting. I think it'll make sense to you when I tell you this, but it, it might not have occurred to you. So there was a big change that occurred in video games when the shift went from stand-up arcades that you put money into to home consoles. And it was purely driven by economics. And here's how it worked. The reason that uh, the, the arcade operators bought the coin-op games was to make money. And people put quarters into them, and so the games had to be short. They lasted one, two, or three minutes. And you had to put another quarter into it. So it, 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 it was not only didn't happen, it was basically forbidden to make hour-long games, or even 20-minute games, okay? Because people, it would make them mad if they had to put in 30 quarters to play one game. It just, it just didn't fit with that quarter at a time model. But then when the first consoles came out, the Atari 2600 being one of the first, the most successful of the first, you pay 200 bucks to get the console, and you pay 25 bucks to get the adventure cartridge, for example. And then it was paid for, and so I was lucky to be there at the right time, right place at the right time, because uh, something like an adventure game would never happen on the arcade games, because of the orders thing. And, but it took, it took the better part of an hour sometimes, or more maybe, to play adventure, depending on what you're doing. And, and you all know, I'm sure you've played RPGs and adventure games, that it's common to take weeks now to play all the way through them, right? Or longer, maybe. So it, it's, this change 
And when I've been on a panel with other video game designers from that era, they all nod their heads. <laughs> it was driven by economics, going from quarters to owning the thing, and long games. Yeah, you can never play a uh, whole genre, so you can never play uh, Final Fantasy on an arcade game, uh, or arcade cabinet, or SimCity, or Civilization, or anything like that. You could, you'd just be very poor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mad. <laughs> In your uh, preservation of the uh, cabinets, have you been able to uh, preserve any of the moving cabinets or any of the multi screen cabinets? Yes, actually, we have. Do you remember TX1, the yeah. Atari three screen driving game? Yeah. We have a TX1 out on the floor. We have the full motion uh, Sega Space Harrier cabinet. Uh, we have the full motion Afterburner, the big one that rocks back and forth. Um, Do you remember I, R360, the one that you turn oh, upside geez. down? Have yes. <laughs> seen pictures of one? I've never seen one in person. I don't know. Play it. It's awesome. <laughs> oh, somehow I just falls out of your pockets. <laughs> All I can just imagine is just from like dealing with the public for 30 plus years. <laughs> All I could think of of a game like that is when someone throws up in it, who's going to clean it up? <laughs> That's, that was the first thought when someone showed me one of those. Uh, I don't know. Wait, we had something else that when I noticed when, when people say arcade game, most people think, oh, it's just okay, you got your circuit board, your monitor, and your cabinet. That's about it. But there's a lot of different kinds of technologies that go into the vast, the wide array. Uh, and one I remember you talking about that's very, very difficult to keep uh, intact as it originally was were these laser disc games, like Dragon Slayer for oh, Space sure. Days. Yeah. Now, I, uh, back in the day, I remember when those were new. All right, and it's, you kind of date yourself, and you're like, wow, that's an antique now, and I remember when it was new. Um, you're but, old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, somehow that happens every year. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the laser disc, they came out, and, People saw them. And went, wow, this is great! And I have to talk a whole bunch faster. So, long story short, is <laughs> laser disc games were—they they were going to be the savior of the coin-op industry. Now, look at this; it's, the, the graphics are amazing, but the gameplay is not the greatest. It just becomes memory, you know. Left, <coughs> left, forward, sword, right, right, back. And once you memorize the pattern, you can just play through the whole game. And but the problem is, they were using home laser disc players in them. And they were not made to run that for the hours of an ar that an arcade was open. And what they were made to do was you put your movie in at home and that laser moved across and read all the data and you watched your movie. Well, the problem is in the arcade, they were taking and controlling that head and moving it like this, searching all the time for scenes. Every time you hit that button, it was searching for the scene it was supposed to go to and they just wore out. And consequently, being even, you know, from the operator's standpoint, they just broke down. And you'd send the laser display back to get it fixed. It would come back a month later. It would work for two weeks. It would crap out again. So it was this constant thing. Send it in, get it fixed, get it back. Send it in, get it back. And then it's, you know, I know this is like, you know, you mentioned it to the collector community, conversion kits. And they cringe, but it's like you know, it was it was like you said before, economics. You you need you were in a business. You needed to make money. You couldn't afford to sit there and keep dumping hundreds and hundreds of dollars into that Dragon's Lair cabinet to keep it running. You know, it's like all right, hey, look, four hundred ninety-five bucks. We can buy this conversion and get rid of this thing that's driving us nuts. You strip it out with the conversion kit in it, and it's a chop lifter. That's yeah, exactly. this is a running joke with us because we have found so many gutted out. Laser disc games converted to Choplifter. <laughs> and, you know, so when, when we get them, a lot of times we get a cabinet and that's it. Nothing. Nothing. So, you know, you search eBay, you find a marquee, you find a control panel. And what we have done to keep the laser disc games out on the floor for people to play, all the laser discs are running emulators. And it's just, it's matter of fact reality. Do you want to play the game or do you want to look at the dark cabinet with the out of order sticker on it? 
And we found that a lot of people would much rather play the game. So that was the one concession we made with emulators is that the laser disc games would have to do it. It was a matter of necessity. I mean, that's one of the things that we've really prided ourselves on at ACAM is that it's always all original hardware. It was the way it was played back in the day. But in the case of LaserDisc, there's just no way. I mean, we would go bankrupt trying to keep LaserDisc games running, and that was the one concession that we had to make in order to keep things not just running, but running reliably. Um, I think we have about one minute left. Does anyone have any really quick questions? I wanted to ask, anyone have an arcade nearby? Just show of hands if you have an arcade you can go to. See, that's such a bummer. I don't even know. <laughs> I, I, when I lived in Portland, there was one called Ground Control. That yeah. was, it's a barcade, and that's kind of how they're still businesses, then they became a nightclub. And it's a bummer, it's such a bummer to see the rope out in front, and it's like, are you on the list? Go away. I've heard, I've heard that barcades are Kind of the rise they're starting to make a rise, and, but it's yeah, all again. It's all about business. Well, I mean, they can make more money. For sure. They can they can make more money. Yeah, it's a shame with Ground Control. It was like the only place in Portland you could really get in on play some of these old games. They they pride themselves on a huge pinball collection, but then they won a contest to upgrade their their shop. Like they won like this great arcade contest. We got a bunch of money, like thousands of dollars to upgrade, and as a result, they have fewer games in their actual arcades because they used that money to get fancy tables with like illumination on a table and yeah. zero minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much everyone for coming out. Um, I hope you uh, all enjoy the expo. Uh, please visit the ACAM guys. They're in the expo hall in the corner. They have a bunch of free-to-play video games. They have primal rage. <laughs> Just to let you know, if you are looking for an arcade in your area. David uh, runs a website called Orcade, A-U-R-C-A-D-E.com, and he's listing on there where you can find classic games to play.